Uh, okay. So yeah, I've been away for about six months traveling and uh, I was staying in touch with Steve while I was traveling. And um, he suggested first maybe doing a, a talk about my, my travels in part because I went on a kind of philosophical pilgrimage to Athens in Greece uh, and to a little village called Sills in Switzerland that was one of Nietzsche's haunts, the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, so I thought maybe I'll talk about that. But when I was in Greece, I started reading this new book that's getting all this attention, uh, Patrick Deneen's Regime Change. Uh, and I asked Steve if I could review it for the developmentalists and he, he really liked the idea. So he was like, well, you could talk about that or you could talk about your travels. But the more I read the book, the more I realized that the place I was visiting and the philosophers who were from there, Plato and Nietzsche, actually were quite relevant to the content of the book, uh, which is a lot about politics and, and democracy uh, and relevant to our moment uh, in the United States and around the world with what's going on uh, in, uh, in democratic societies. So in true integral fashion, I decided to try and combine them. So uh, I wanna do three things tonight. First, uh, I'll give a little bit about my philosophical pilgrimage, but more importantly, uh, Plato and Nietzsche and some of their ideas and, and how they're relevant to uh, the political situation we find ourselves in and Deneen's book. Uh, the second is I'll talk about the book, who, who is Patrick Deneen? Uh, what is this book about? What does he mean by post-liberalism? which is a sort of fashionable concept uh, on the new right. Uh, and uh, lastly, give a, a kind of integral or developmental take uh, on it. And uh, my, my big, I guess, goal for tonight, an invitation for our group is, is to have us try and think through what is happening on the new right? Uh, how do we make sense of it? You know, I think it's been a, a question in the air ever since Trump got elected. Um, for me, as I've worked on this essay, uh, I've realized that it's, it's become part of a larger project, which is really about trying to figure out what an integral or developmental form of conservatism looks like. Uh, my title for tonight's talk is, is rather cheeky. Uh, I'm modeling it on Deneen's prior book, which was called Why Liberalism Failed. Uh, I don't mean this seriously. I don't think conservatism can fail because I think that there's a, such a thing as essential conservatism and the same thing that there's essential liberalism. These are, as Steve likes to call it, indestructible polarities between conservative and liberal. But I do think that the forms conservatism has taken uh, over the last several decades, and including Deneen's new version of it, uh, are just not really workable options for you know, a pluralistic society. And I'll, I'll talk about why I think that is. Um, but it's also part of a, a broader, uh, at a more personal level, a broader interest. You know, My political awakening was 9-11. Uh, that was when I started first paying attention to you know, what's, what's going on here. Uh, and I quickly, as you know, the Iraq war started and the war on terror got going, I quickly realized I was, I was a man of the left. I was a person of the left. But over the years, I started to tr have this kind of burning desire to understand the conservative mind and the conservative soul. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of what I, what's motivating my talk tonight. And the big idea, uh, I guess, if I could say there is one, is... Uh, some of you may have heard of the quote from FDR uh, in the New Deal. He, he said his goal was to save capitalism from the capitalists. Uh, I think we need to save conservatism from the conservatives. Uh, and I'll talk in my final remarks about why I think developmental thinking can help us try and do that. Uh, so here we go. Uh, this is Athens. Uh, this is the Acropolis uh, at night. Uh, the Acropolis was built in the middle of the 5th century BCE, largely at the direction of Pericles, uh, the great statesman uh, of Athens. Uh, and they built it because they were rich, because they could. Uh, 
they had conquered the Persians uh, and they began to sort of bestride the, uh, the Mediter Mediterranean uh, world as a great naval power uh, and uh, you know, great hub of commerce. Uh, and, uh, and there's me uh, in front of uh, the Parthenon. Uh, it was built in just nine years. Uh, I forget exactly how many billions of dollars uh, in you know, equivalent uh, contemporary dollars it cost, but it was you know, extraordinarily expensive and it, you know, the money shows. Uh, it is a, a stunning sight. I, I have to say, uh, you know, often these famous landmarks and things that you read about and see in books are, are you know, not that impressive when you see them in person. The Parthenon is. Uh, it was kind of the ultimate statement uh, of Athenian supremacy and cultural and economic and political power. Uh, and at the top, there's only one figure who remains, uh, and that is the god Dionysus. Uh, and uh, the joke is sort of that he uh, was too drunk to be able to find his way down uh, from, uh, from the uh, the the top of the Parthenon. It originally contained a, a scene depicting all the major gods. Uh, Dionysus was the only one that remains. He was the god of wine, uh, of revelry, of partying, uh, of the wild, of music, of the dance, but also of the theater. Uh, it just so happens that he's gazing down uh, on the theater that was named after him, the theater of Dionysus. Part of what was so astonishing about the Greek genius is that in the space of a century or two, they you know, arguably invented history, democracy, uh, drama, and philosophy. Uh, and uh, so this is the, the, the theater here on the edge of the Acropolis. This was all part of you know, the center of uh, Athenian public uh, and religious life. This is a view of it uh, from from the ground. Uh, and here we look at the Acropolis uh, from the Agora or the Agora. Uh, this was the public meeting place or marketplace. People would go here to do business, to you know, gossip, share information, uh, and the like. And this is where Socrates famously did his thing of talking to people, and often prominent people, sometimes just commoners. Uh, and asking them questions about, you know, what is virtue, what is justice, uh, what do you think about the gods, these kinds of things. Uh, and it's that kind of annoying questioning that eventually was one of the reasons the Athenians put him on trial and put him to death for corrupting the youth and being disloyal to the gods of the city. So very early on, you might say Socrates was uh, uh, kind of an orange modernist challenging uh, amber traditionalism and, uh, you know, getting in trouble for it. The book that Plato, his student, is most famous for uh, is The Republic. And uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with some Plato and Nietzsche. Uh, and I won't go into too much detail, uh, but uh, I'm assuming that people don't have too much background or their philosophy 101 is a little rusty. But I mentioned the book because uh, it could also be translated the regime. The Greek word being translated is, is, is politeia, politeia. Uh, and for Plato, for Aristotle, for the ancient writers, this had a broader connotation than just the forms of government or the constitutions or the laws. It meant something like the worldview. Uh, it included morality, culture, so it was a broader term than just what we think of as politics. Um, and I mention that because when Deneen talks about a regime change, he's talking about it in this ancient sense of the world, the word. He doesn't just want to you know, put different politicians in power or a different party in power. Um, and he's not talking about eliminating you know, the rule of law and the separation of powers and you know, uh, civil rights and you know, the staples of liberal government. He's talking about a change, more of a change in culture, a change in the ethos, and in particular, a change in the ethos of the elites that you know, run the society. And by elites, 
he doesn't just mean politicians, though he does. He also means heads of corporations, uh, people in the media, uh, scientific experts. Uh, he means, uh, and I'll come back to this later, some of you may be familiar with Rush Limbaugh's notion of the four corners of deceit uh, of the liberal world, of uh, the media, academia, government, and science. Um, it's that broader conception uh, of elites who are corrupt and who are you know, oppressing and deceiving the people and taking advantage of them and so on. So I'll come back to that in a little bit uh, later. The Republic, the book, is, takes place in one room. Uh, it's a conversation between uh, a bunch of, uh, you know, kind of wealthy, well-off uh, Athenian male citizens about the nature of justice. And I just want to make a couple points about the book that uh, are relevant to uh, democracy and, and what we're going through. Um, there's a lot of people who are looking back to Plato, including Deneen, um, to try and make sense of, you know, what's, what's going wrong uh, in our, our democracy. And the Republic is trying to answer this question of what is justice? And we get a few definitions put out right at the beginning of the book. Uh, so the old man whose house it is says, justice is telling the truth and paying your debts, basically so that, you know, you go to the good place uh, after, uh, after you die. So it's saving your own skin. His son says, justice is about benefiting your buddies uh, and harming your enemies. So looking out for, for your own. Socrates counters and says, well, no, if, if you're hurting your enemies, then you're actually making them worse people. Um, and that, that can't be good. Uh, and I'm simplifying his argument here, but he says it, it's, it's doing right by everybody. And I just want to point out that if you think about those definitions for a minute, they follow a certain logic from egocentric to ethnocentric to world-centric. This is just in the first few pages of the Republic. And, uh, you know, for this and other reasons, it's, I think you can make a case that Plato was a, a sort of proto-integral thinker, um, thinking about these different kind of perspectives or worldviews on morality. But there's another definition that gets thrown in. And this is from Thrasymachus. Uh, he says, justice is the advantage of the stronger. It's might makes right. Uh, good and bad, that's made up by the people in power to, you know, keep to stay in power, to justify their own power. They're just duping the, the dumb people. So the, the, the strong, the clever, they tell a story to you know, justify their own power. So right there, Thrasymachus is throwing us into the spiral. He's saying justice, politics, it's all about power. It's all down at red. And uh, if you don't see that, you're a sucker. Um, and uh, there's obvious connections here with Trump uh, that I'll come back to in a little bit. But right there, right at the beginning of the Western uh, political philosophy tradition, we get these big questions raised that we're still grappling with. And there's more later in the book that uh, engages them even more pointedly. One thing that's strange to us about the way Plato and the ancients thought about justice was they didn't start thinking about rules and laws and regulations and all this. They started by looking at human nature and, uh, and psychology. Uh, Steve likes to quote a line from Plato uh, in some of his writings that I'll quote here. Uh, the regimes are as the men are. They grow out of human characters. The ancients thought that we can't really understand politics without understanding psychology and vice versa. So Plato lays out this view of human nature uh, of a three-part soul, that we have our, our reasoning part, our spirited part, uh, the emotional part, and the appetitive part that wants you know, food and drink and, and sex and so on. Uh, and he thinks that a, a just soul is a well-ordered soul in which the part that should rule does rule. The part that's equipped to rule does rule. So the reason ruling over the emotions and ruling over the appetites. Um, and you know, this is something we also 
talk about in integral circles about you know the head, the heart, uh, and the gut, the the three centers. So Plato is you know already intuiting this basic psychology, and this means developing virtues, uh, developing the excellence of each part. So wisdom is the virtue of the rational part, courage the virtue of the spirited part, and uh, moderation especially as the virtue or temperance is the virtue of the appetitive part. And this allows for a kind of harmony and blending between the parts. And that notion of blending between different parts and between different classes is really central to Patrick Deneen's argument. And I'll come back to that later. So Plato sees this kind of uh, mirror between the well-ordered soul and the well-ordered society. Uh, and, you know, Plato was an aristocrat. Uh, he thought that, you know, only a few people are going to be fit out to rule. Only a few people are led primarily by their reason, who desire knowledge and the good for everybody, the good universally, not just the good for themselves. Uh, so, you know, most people uh, just, you know, want to satisfy their appetites and do their work and feed their family and, you know, go about their business. And then the auxiliaries are the soldiers who we want to be, you know, courageous to, to keep the peace and defend people and all that. So we get this three-tiered, you know, kind of hierarchical view of classes and a hierarchical view of, uh, of the soul. And it's the idea that a well-ordered society will produce well-ordered people who will, in turn, you know, maintain a well-ordered society. Um, so Plato thought democracy, like most thinkers in the ancient world, he thought democracy was one of the worst forms of government. And this is, of course, con completely contrary to our own intuitions. Uh, and he was particularly concerned about the ways in which democracy collapses into tyranny. Uh, and I won't go into all these other regimes, but we'll just focus on democracy and tyranny, because this has been, you know, the story really of the last, gosh, I guess seven or eight years now. It's hard to believe how long we've been in this, uh, this strange dream or nightmare, depending on how you frame it. Um, so, you know, this has been what we've all been, you know, pulling our hair out over and this bevy of books about uh fascism and illiberal democracy and tyranny uh, and so on, some of which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, and, uh, you know, Plato's suspicions about democracy are not confined to the ancient world. Winston Churchill famously said democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. The best argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. Um, but one voice in particular uh, that I know we, we discuss sometimes in the developmental circle is Andrew Sullivan. And he wrote this very influential piece in 2016 in the summer before Trump was elected. And it draws really heavily on book eight of the Republic uh, to show how democracies, when they go sideways, they produce demagogues and they collapse in on themselves. And some of the issues here have to do with democracy's elevation of freedom and equality above all else. Uh, in the spiral dynamics language, you know, one of the equations that often gets discussed is that green postmodernism dissolves amber or blue traditionalism, uh, and you get moral relativism. Uh, but also that green can dissolve orange uh, modernism where we start to lose faith in facts and experts and science, and we enter into epistemic relativism, where nobody knows what's true, and people start to not care what's true. Um, so Plato foresaw a lot of this in that equality tends to, the emphasis on equality tends to want to dismantle hierarchy. And any lines of authority between parents and children, teachers and students, uh, rulers and the ruled, uh, experts and laymen. Uh, so that's one problem with equality and also with freedom. Democracy defines the good as freedom and freedom is whatever feels good. 
people start to be ruled by their appetites rather than their reason. And so they lose any sense of proportion or restraint and any sense of virtue to restrain uh, their passions. So what moderns can often think of as freedom, you know, doing, you know, the freedom to do what you want, as long as you don't hurt anybody. For Plato and the ancients, they saw that as a form of slavery, being enslaved to the appetites and not really free. And that's a big part of Deneen's uh, argument that I'll come back to in a little bit. And Plato has a, a beautiful line where he says, democracies get drunk on the unmixed wine of freedom. Democracies get drunk on the unmixed wine of freedom. The Greeks uh, mixed their wine with water to dilute it. Uh, so he saw this as sort of, you know, uh, uh, going, going overboard. So they lose respect for authority and for what's higher, for the tradition. Uh, and they also lose any sense that some people are qualified to rule, that some people might have either uh, mental or moral qualities that you know, make them uh, quite, quite out to be a better rule. And Sullivan just devastatingly basically takes Trump's portrait of the tyrant and layers it against so much uh, uh, Plato's portrait of the tyrant and puts it next to uh, a lot of Trump's behavior and comments. And it's just devastating. Uh, Sullivan writes, he is of the elite yet has a common touch. He attacks his wealthy peers as corrupt. He attacks the elites, journalists, academics, politicians, takes over an obedient mob, cuts through the paralysis of democratic incoherence, drain the swamp, demonizes foreigners or domestic minorities, um, and is utterly lacking in self-control. And one of the things that Socrates says happens in a democracy is people start to see vices as virtues. So Trump tells it like it is, even though he's completely dishonest. So somehow lying becomes, in a weird way, a kind of honesty, as he's sticking it to the elites. He's owning the libs. Uh, Trump is strong. So rashness comes to be seen as a kind of courage. Uh, moderation restraint come to be seen as, you know, weakness. Uh, you got to be a killer. Um, impulsiveness is a virtue. Um, so all of this is what leads Trump to, uh, Sullivan to conclude that Trump is a, an extinction level threat. Uh, and uh, I think Plato would be, uh, would probably agree. So uh, the next stop on our tour uh, is Switzerland. Um, and uh, I have to say that, uh, you know, when you walk through these, uh, these meadows and hike these mountains, like it's total sound of music <laughs> type vibe. The hills are alive with the sound of music. Uh, it's not hard to see why Nietzsche returned uh, again and again to this little, uh, this little hamlet uh, in the mountains, Sills, a uh, little village, uh, and found such inspiration. Uh, in it. So when I was here, I stayed at uh, the Nietzsche house. That is literally what it is called. Uh, this is a little house Nietzsche stayed at for eight summers uh, when he, uh, where, he, where he conceived and wrote a lot of his major works. Uh, and they turned it into a kind of museum and, you know, shrine and pilgrimage site, but also a place you can stay at. So this is a uh, Nietzsche's room they, they preserved uh, as it was uh, and, and roped it off. Uh, and around the, the village, there's some famous, you know, sort of Nietzsche, Nietzsche sites and Nietzsche lore. This is the giant pyramid rock where he had the, the great insight uh, behind his major work, Thus Spoke uh, Zarathustra. Um, this is a, uh, just a kind of a kind of a blooper. I don't know if anybody saw the line, uh, the 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 article. This was just yesterday. Uh, Texas woman. Uh, it sounds like one of these Florida man stories. Uh, Texas woman was attacked by at the same time by a snake and a hawk, uh, and uh, she was apparently fine. Um, but 
uh, it's related to Nietzsche because this is a, on the right is a, a two statues outside of the Nietzsche house of an eagle and a serpent. Uh, they were important symbols in uh, Nietzsche's philosophy because uh, they were, were his sort of companion animals and they were, uh, they, the eagle and the serpent were friends. Uh, and for him, this was a symbol of uniting heaven and earth. Um, but also more importantly, this notion of the unifying of opposites plays a central role in, uh, in Nietzsche's philosophy and the idea that if we go too far in one direction, then we lose ourselves. And the serpent in particular was a positive symbol for him because he thought that a lot of what was deranged about Christianity uh, and, and modernity was a sort of rejection of the way things are. Uh, so the snake representing the body, nature, impermanence, uh, death and resurrection, uh, and so on. Um, so that's another matter, but more just a kind of funny side, uh, 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 side sidebar. So how is Nietzsche relative to politics and to democracy in particular? A lot of people, when they hear his name, they associate him with the Nazis and with good reason. Uh, Adolf Hitler was a huge fan of Nietzsche. This is Hitler uh, meeting Nietzsche's sister, Elizabeth, who, after he, Nietzsche died, took his works and uh, basically edited them and arranged them in order to support her own uh, anti-Semitism and uh, German nationalism. Uh, so she had this political agenda and she tried to force her brother's philosophy to fit that narrative. And for a long time, uh, Nietzsche was very tightly associated with the Nazis. Uh, his notion of the Superman or Ubermensch uh, was embraced as, you know, producing this master race and the next phase in humanity. Uh, and, you know, you can see how that could fit into the Nazis' fascist ideology. Um, and this continues today. Uh, many of you probably are familiar with Richard Spencer, uh, who was one of the leaders of the alt-right and organized the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville uh, in 2017, uh, where people chanted, you will not replace us, Jews will not replace us. He read Nietzsche's genealogy of morals in college and it radicalized him. This idea of you know, strength and this kind of hyper-masculine idea of you know master values of the master uh, of domination uh, and uh, you know very ethnocentric um, uh, and so on so it's still in the culture now this depends on perversions of Nietzsche's thought Nietzsche was clearly uh, against anti-semitism against German nationalism uh, and, uh, and it's a longer story uh, but it's a place in our culture where his ideas are still finding, uh, influence, uh, sometimes in, uh, in harmful ways. So essentially, a lot of people thinking, uh, channeling Red Nietzsche, uh, or the warrior conscious, consciousness Nietzsche in, uh, in developmental terms. Um, all of which, of course, uh, Nietzsche found, um, you know, not amusing. But the idea for which he's most well known, and uh, what I want to focus on is the notion of the death of God. Uh, so this is the idea he's probably most famous for. But what he means by this is more complex than what we tend to think. Um, so I'll get the obligatory Nietzsche joke out of the way um, and also get out of the way the less obvious joke. Uh, Nietzsche wrote this. Um, he oddly was very prescient about how famous he was going to become um, before he died. Uh, he had no recognition uh, in his life for his works, but shortly after he died, they started to, to spread throughout Europe and, and uh, have great influence. But the death of God is two-sided. On the one hand, he thought it was cause for celebration and joy. We're finally throwing off the yoke of, you know, oppressive traditional values and superstition. So on one sense, he's like, you know, pro-modernity, great, 
science is getting rid of superstitious religion. We're free. Uh, now we can create new values. Awesome. Um, on the other hand, it's also a lament and a warning. He realized that as oppressive and restricting and limited sort of mythic religion, you know, amber traditional religion was, it also gave people something, some overenter, some sacred canopy, some sense of meaning. And without that, he thought people would spiritually and, star and morally starve. So the death of God creates a, a kind of existential vacuum and a moral vacuum and a, a vacuum in society. And he was worried about the consequences of this. So you could liken the death of God to a, just to a supernova, an exploding star. It gives off great beauty and it releases so much energy, but it's also very destructive. And just as supernovas take, you know, millions of light years to actually reach our eye after they've happened, he thought the death of God would, was a, something that would unfold over decades and centuries. And he thought it would have disastrous consequences because in the vacuum of Christianity and, you know, traditional religion, he thought people would try to substitute other things. I'm going to play a clip from Fight Club to kind of ground this. Uh, in contemporary culture. Man, I see in Fight Club the strongest and smartest men who've ever lived. I see all this potential, and I see squandered. God damn it, an entire generation pumping gas, waiting tables, slaves with white collars. Advertising has us chasing cars and clothes, working jobs we hate so we can buy shit we don't need. We're the middle children of history, man. No purpose or place. We have no great war, no great depression. Our great war is a spiritual war. Our great depression is our lives. We've all been raised on television to believe that one day we'd all be millionaires and movie gods and rock stars. But we won't. We're slowly learning that fact. And we're very, very pissed off. So, uh, this was 1999. Uh, and, you know, if we look at both the metrics on, you know, teen mental health, uh, as well as, you know, a growing kind of red conservatism, particularly among younger men, uh, and then pair that with you know what's going on with uh, you know January sixth and all this, uh, it's bad news culturally for uh, for the future of the country. So all of which is to say, um, modernity turns you know male energy from this kind of Homer to this kind of Homer. Uh, passive consumers. Um, and uh, in the end of history in The Last Man, uh, probably one of the most famous works of political science in the late 20th century, Francis Fukuyama, uh, you know, I think we all know the story. The end of history, the first part of the title is about the end of the Cold War. Liberal democracy and, and democratic capitalism emerge triumphant. Uh, history is over in the sense of a contest between competing ideologies for how we're going to order our societies. The rest is a mop-up job. Um, nothing's going to overcome democracy politically and capitalism economically. But people didn't finish, focus as much on the second part of the title, the last man. Uh, this is a phrase that Fukuyama took from Nietzsche. Uh, and I'll read a short quote from uh, his text on this. The typical citizen of a liberal democracy was that individual who, schooled by Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, gave up prideful belief in his or her own superior worth in favor of comfortable self-preservation. For Nietzsche, democratic man was composed entirely of desire and reason, 
clever at finding new ways to satisfy a host of petty wants through the calculation of long-term self-interest. And he continues, the life of the last man is one of physical security and material plenty, precisely what Western politicians are fond of promising their electorates. Is this really what the human story has been all about these past few millennia? So modernity gives us peacefulness, comfort, security, but we lose a sense of, you know, we're part of some great struggle. Um, we lose a sense of being part of history. Uh, and the title of this chapter is Men Without Chests. Uh, it's a line from C.S. Lewis, where to go back to that three-part soul uh, schematic from Plato, we've got the reason, we've got the appetites, but we don't have the spirit. The, the thumos is the Greek term, the courage, the pride, the, uh, the sense of belonging and connection uh, to you know, being part of something great. Uh, and uh, buckle your seatbelt uh, for this next line from a commentator who writes that in describing the shallow celebrity culture, the essential emptiness of the habitat of the last man, Fukuyama had a particular example in mind. He went to the same individual for illustration when looking for an archetype of megalothumia, which is greatness of soul. Who else but a developer like Donald Trump? Fukuyama wrote that in the early 90s. In other words, the alienation uh, and resentment uh, felt by the last man, people disaffected with modernity, would make them an easy mark for a figure like Trump. So all which is to say, both in Plato and Nietzsche, we see this critique of democracy about the psychology of democracy and how that makes it vulnerable to take over by a demagogue. Um, so all that is preface to Patrick Deneen. So who's Patrick Deneen? He is a uh, professor of political philosophy at Notre Dame, uh, and he became sort of semi-famous for a book he wrote in 2018 called Why Liberalism Failed. Uh, Obama put it on his best books of list. Uh, he may regret that now that uh, in regime change, all, in regime change, all you really know about Obama is that he one time remarked at a fundraiser that working class people cl cling to their guns and their religion. Um, so uh, I don't know what Obama thinks about the new book. Um, but it's, it's, the book's gotten a lot of attention. It's been you know, reviewed all over the place. It's, it's a really hot book of the summer. So I'm interested in you know, not just this argument, but why is a book with this thesis getting the attention that it's getting? This is a recent write-up of Deneen in Politico about an event that he headlined in Washington, DC uh, just a few weeks ago. And this quote from him at the top really speaks volumes because he, as I mentioned before, isn't interested in regime change in the sense of, you know, winning an election or, uh, or di di dismantling the institutions of liberal democracy. He wants a cultural change in the kinds of elites that rule. At this event, speaking with him was J.D. Vance, the Ohio Senator, famous for Hillbilly Elegy, uh, one of the books that became so popular in the wake of Trump of people trying to understand, you know, this was the, the sorties to diners in middle America to figure out how do they think, um, who rose to prominence. I will add as, as a side note, um, my own theory is that this book is similar to what many people think Machiavelli's book, The Prince was, which is a job application. Machiavelli wrote The Prince as a gift to one of the uh, nephews of Lorenzo Medici. Uh, and it's widely believed that he was trying to basically say, if you get into power, do these things and 
I know what I'm talking about, so I should be one of your advisors in your new cabinet. Uh, do not be surprised if in 2028 or 2032, J.D. Vance runs for president and Patrick Deneen is one of the advisors in his administration. Um, I think that's actually exactly uh, what, he's, what he's up to with this book for reasons I'll explain in a moment. This is him uh, holding an audience with Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary, uh, who as many of you probably know, uh, is sort of one of those, regarded by many as one of those bad guys, uh, pulling off an illiberal democratic state. Um, uh, you know, cr Christian nationalism is one way it's commonly called. Uh, Deneen is quite sympathetic to him. Uh, and you can't see in the background, but back there is Rod Dreher, who is uh, one of his fellow post-liberal uh, travelers, um, uh, who I'll mention in a moment. Deneen's book is part of a tradition of thinking that is in sort of the conservative Catholic intellectual world uh, that you could trace to a book called After Virtue uh, by Alastair McIntyre that I know Steve uh, is drawn on quite a bit in his own work. Uh, and I wanna read a quote from the end of that book because it could come almost word for word from regime change. It speaks to the worldview that Deneen is speaking from. So McIntyre writes, a crucial turning point in that earlier history of the Roman Empire occurred when men and women of goodwill turned aside from the task of shoring up the Roman Imperium and ceased to identify the continuation of civility and moral community with the maintenance of that Imperium. What matters at this stage is the construction of local forms of community within which civility and the intellectual and moral life can be sustained through the new dark ages which are already upon us. And if the tradition of the virtues was able to survive the horrors of the last dark ages, we are not entirely without grounds for hope. This time, however, the barbarians are not waiting beyond the frontiers. They have already been governing us for quite some time. And it is our lack of consciousness of this that constitutes part of our predicament. We are waiting not for a Godot, but for another doubtless very different Saint Benedict. So new dark ages, uh, we must raise our consciousness to become aware of the spell of liberal uh, nihilism we're living under uh, and so on. This is all, Deneen, Deneen fits into this worldview very powerfully. And it's also espoused more recently by Rod Dreher, who was in that photo I shared earlier, uh, with Victor Orban, uh, Dreher wrote this book, The Benedict Option. And just to share with you some of the language just from the foreword, um, Christians are under assault. Uh, we're on the front lines of the religious liberty battle. Uh, Christian colleges either capitulate to Caesar or close their doors. A sense of powerlessness in the face of a cultural riptide of relativism that's carrying so many Christian young out to a secularist sea. The growing darkness, the church militant, the long struggle, Christians besieged, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Deneen's very much in this camp uh, as well. And in his prior book, Why Liberalism Failed, he seemed to very much support that idea, you know, let a thousand Benedict options bloom, more of a bottom-up approach. In the new book, however, it's all top-down. Uh, he seems to have said the long, you know, the long game bottom-up approach is not enough. And there's no notion that liberalism has brought us anything good as he did in the earlier book. So he's kind of doubling down. Um, and, uh, in the new book, liberalism is not just a catastrophe, but a conspiracy. Uh, the new book is more of the Flight 93 election mindset that some of you might be familiar with. Uh, Michael Anton, conservative writer, used this metaphor for the 2016 election. So basically, uh, if we don't storm the cockpit, the progressives will crash the plane. We have to use, as Deneen says, Machiavellian means 
in order to attain Aristotelian ends. We have to, we have to seize power to you know, right the ship of Western civilization or we're going down. Um, so I'll just uh, very quickly summarize uh, the book and offer a few quick criticisms and then uh, open it up for, for discussion. So uh, liberalism failed, he says, because it succeeded because it became sort of the total philosophy of Western civilization. Um, and uh, it's hyper-individualism is what, uh, and distorted view of liberty is what uh, has made it generate so many problems. The ancients saw liberty as being about self-restraint. Freedom was inner freedom from the appetites that we gain through developing the virtues. For the moderns, freedom becomes external freedom. It's, it's having options, options for who to date, options for you know, what, to, what to do for a career. It's about external freedom to satisfy my desires. Um, in other words, modern freedom is a kind of slavery from the ancient's perspective. Whereas Aristotle and Plato saw, free, saw the human being as inherently social and political, and at us as inheritors of a tradition to which we are responsible and that we have duties to transmit and pass on, um, that's been replaced by the view of us as first and foremost individuals with rights. And the purpose of government is to protect those rights and you know, to protect our physical security and our property. Uh, it's not about promoting virtue. For the ancients, as Aristotle said, the purpose of laws was to make people good. It wasn't just about economic growth and security. And so the state was, should actively promote some notion of the common good. For the moderns, politics becomes more about power and about protecting people's individual rights. The state should be agnostic about what the good is. Let people figure that out for themselves. When Deneen would be asked the question of what do these three men have in common? Uh, it's not that they are politicians, it's that they're all liberals. Liberalism has a very broad meaning for him. It means an ideology of progress. So this includes classical liberals coming from John Locke. We might think of the center right or the, the orange meme, you know, modernism, uh, you know, economic growth, progress through economic uh, growth, progressive liberalism, social progress, um, or even Marx, progress through revolution and the advent of communism. They all think that progress is what we should be up to, um, either economic or social or some combination thereof. We tend to think of liberalism as an egalitarian project. It's about equality and equal rights and so on. He claims it's an elitist project. Um, it rewards only those who you know, succeed at the game of capital acquisition uh, or of accumulating social capital and, and credentials. So he thinks it actually generates oppression, partly through generating massive economic inequality. Um, and also, liberalism is not neutral. This is the lie he thinks that it's at the heart of it. It actually involves imposing a set of values on people and destroying traditional values. Um, so I'll skip over a couple things just to wrap up. By post-liberalism, the, the quickest definition for this term is right on culture and left on economics. So he proposes what he calls common good conservatism and a mixed regime in which you have elites who act to benefit the people and not themselves. Elites who have traditional values social conservative values um, who aren't in it for themselves. Um, he describes his view as aristopopulism, uh, which is, does not exactly roll off the tongue. Um, uh, and I'll just uh, read a, a quote to convey what he means by that. Self-conscious aristoi, that is great ones, who understand that their main role and purpose in the social order is to secure the foundational goods that make possible human flourishing for ordinary people. The central goods of family, community, good work, blah, 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 constraints upon corporate power 
and a culture that preserves and encourages order and continuity and support for religious belief and in institutions. So uh, that's, that's what he wants. And he thinks popular uprisings in order to shake up the elite uh, are, a, are a, an acceptable means to make that happen. What's astonishing is he does not write at all about January 6th, which is arguably a form of exactly what he wants the populace to rise up, push out the corrupt elites to make room for the installation of uh, good elites. And lastly, Deneen is part of a rising group called uh, Integralism, which is not our version of integral. Uh, it's a Catholic project, and it's integral in the sense that traditional is integral. Uh, so I won't go into detail about that. I'll just end by saying, you know, if we think about this in terms of the spiral, what Deneen is against is not liberalism, it's libertinism. Amber sees everything above it as if it's below it. So they see liberalism as red, as people just wantonly doing what they want and having no virtue and so on. There's a piece of the truth there because we do get a lot of narcissism right? This was one of Wilbur's points, boomeritis is narcissism and nihilism. Um, but that's not the whole story. There's also amazing shadow dynamics. Um, he doesn't seem aware that the very thing he's calling for is what he's critiquing among elites. Um, this authoritarianism uh, and this, you know, thinking that elites thinking they know what the people want, that's what conservatives have always critiqued uh, progressives for doing. So there's some shadow projection, I think, going on uh, on there. He also fails to distinguish between modern and postmodern. He claims that classical and progressive liberalism are identical. They're the same project. They're, they're all after progress. But as we know, green is exactly a response to the excesses of mean orange, um, uh, of mean modernism that generates inequality, that separates people from place uh, and community. So he, he doesn't get that. Um, he praises German working councils at one point uh, where you know workers get decision-making power. And I was reading this, I'm like, there's a word for that, democratic socialism. So a lot of the things that he proposes are things that progressives have been talking about for a long time. Um, but it's because there's the difference on cultural issues that he uh, rejects them. And the last thing I'll say is that uh, I think that precisely because traditionalism, modernism, and progressivism are established traditions, not just of thought, but of practice, of living, as conservatives, we should want to find a way to preserve all of them and blend them together. So I agree with him about a mixed regime and blending uh, to the extent possible, but not by wanting to get rid of the two other you know, major worldviews and value systems. That's a dramatically unconservative and radical project. So uh, in the words of Ken from Barbie, uh, that is Kenuff. Oh, that was great, David. Thank you so much. I'm going to hit the stop recording button.